Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Joey Lindstrom with the National Low Income Housing Coalition, and you are here for the weekly Monday update uh, and sharing on NLIHC's housed campaign, uh, Universal, Stable, Affordable Housing for Everyone. Um, so working on housed involves quite a lot of, uh, of policy changes and quite a lot of great organizing um, of people throughout the country. Um, but we will start with the most pressing issue, which is the Build Back Better Act. Um, I will remind all of you as we get started that you can put questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen or in the chat box. And we will be calling out uh, some of those questions during the presentation. And our excellent roster of panelists today will be um, addressing some of those questions as well. Um, thanks for being here. And Kim Johnson from the policy team, why don't you take it away? Great. Thanks so much, Joey. And hi, everyone. Um, like Joey said, my name is Kim Johnson. I'm a policy analyst here at the National Low Income Housing Coalition. And I'm filling in for Sarah today to bring you our regularly scheduled updates from Capitol Hill. So the House was slated to vote on the Build Back Better Act last Friday, but seven moderate Democrats announced that they would withhold their vote on the package until the Congressional Budget Office released their cost estimate for the bill. House progressives were in turn holding, uh, withholding their support for the bipartisan infrastructure bill until they had assurance that Build Back Better would receive a vote. So that's two separate bills, the bipartisan bill and Build Back Better. So in the midst of Friday's deadlock, um, representatives from the Congressional Black Caucus proposed a two-step solution. First, the House would pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill that night, along with second, a rule allowing for floor debate on the reconciliation package, which is the first step to receiving a full vote on the bill in the House. So the House passed that bipartisan bill on Friday, which to be clear does not include any housing provisions, as well as the rule to hold a vote on the Build Back Better Act. So now the House is planning on voting for Build Back Better as soon as next week, assuming that the Congressional Budget Office is able to score the bill by then and that numbers from the Budget Office are in line with the White House's estimates. So whether or not the um, CBO score is released by next week remains to be seen, and it's very possible that the vote will be pushed back. It's important to note that because of the extremely narrow margins in the House, Democrats can only afford to lose three votes if they want the Build Back Better Act passed. House progressives have been holding firm to their stance that both the bipartisan infrastructure bill and Build Back Better needed to move at the same time in order for them to support the bipartisan infrastructure bill. But with the bipartisan bill out of the House and on its way to the president's desk for his signature, there's significantly less leverage to wield over moderates to ensure that Build Back Better is enacted. So that there's a lot of concern that with the bipartisan bill passed, moderates will back out on supporting Build Back Better. We're asking advocates to keep the pressure on their members of Congress to get this bill done. While every call and email matters, we're also targeting moderate Democrats who held out on voting for Build Back Better on Friday, as well as our forever targets, Senators Joe Manchin of West Virginia and Kristen Sinema of Arizona. Those House members that we're targeting include Representatives Ed Case of Hawaii, Jared Golden of Maine, Josh Gottenheimer of New Jersey, Stephanie Murphy of Florida, uh, Representative Kathleen Rice of New York, Kurt Schrader of Oregon, and Abigail Spanberger of Virginia. So I'm gonna post those names to the chat, um, which I'm sure is a lot easier to remember than me just listing them off. Um, we uh, will need to keep the pressure on Congress to get this bill enacted. Um, it is not, the fight is not over until the ink is dry on the president's signature. Um, over the next few weeks, Congress will be on recess and in their districts. They are on recess this week, back on the Hill next week, when they'll hopefully take a vote on the package and out again the week of November 22nd for Thanksgiving. If a vote is not taken next week, it is likely that this process is going to drag out into December. So now is the perfect time to schedule an in-district meeting with your members of Congress on the importance of enacting the Build Back Better Act with these vital housing provisions that are currently included in the bill. Once it passes the House, the bill still faces a slog through the Senate where Senators Manchin and Sinema are still reluctant to publicly declare their support for the bill. The bill will also have to clear a number of procedural hurdles, including what's known as a bird bath, 
where the Senate parliamentarian reviews the bill for any provisions that violate the Byrd Rule, which limits the kinds of policies that can be included in a reconciliation package. The bill will also be subjected to a vote arama a marathon voting procedure in the Senate where senators can offer an unlimited number of amendments to the bill. So the bill that passes the Senate will likely be different in some ways from the House version, and the House will likely need to take one more vote on the bill, on the Build Back Better Act, before it makes its way to the president's desk. So that is my update on Build Back Better. I am happy to answer any questions, and in the meantime, I'll turn it back over to you, Joey. Uh, one question that's come in, uh, Kim, is when you say, when you refer to CBO scoring or Congressional Budget Office scoring, uh, what does that mean? What does that look like? Yeah, so the Congressional Budget Office, it's kind of a complicated um, process of analysis um, that usually takes a little while. So that's part of why we're not positive if we were going to see the CBO score next week or if we're going to have to wait a little bit longer in order to see it. Basically, the CBO score will tell us how much the um, Congressional Budget Office anticipates the bill will cost over um, its lifespan, as well as any kind of revenues that the bill is going to bring in that will offset those costs. Thank you for that. Uh, Elizabeth, in, um, Elizabeth in Maine asks a question about um, why we're using the term moderates when, when perhaps uh, Senators Manchin and some of the other uh, people we have listed as moderate are, are showing some more conservative tendencies. And uh, honestly, I feel like there, there probably isn't any term that'll, that'll be befitting of everyone's perspective on these senators and representatives. Uh, I think we've used the term centrist at times as well. Uh, Kim, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly don't disagree with um, Elizabeth's comments. Um, it's well, nomenclature is something that I think we, we use the term moderate or centrist to describe to, as a way of describing these senators um, and representatives in a way that everybody understands. Um, and in order not to confuse the folks with, you know, the differences between conservative versus Republican and all of that. So just keeping in mind that all of these folks identify are, are part of the Democratic Party. Um, and then the kind of um, specificity around moderates versus conservative Democrats within that um, is really going to be up to individual discretion. But just for the sake of kind of using a common language, we usually just refer to them as moderates or centrists. That's great. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, and I'll mention uh, for folks on the call that we are about to begin more actively encouraging folks to uh, to do a tactic that we used to do a lot, which is meeting with members of Congress uh, while they are at home and doing either direct lobby meetings or hosting members of Congress um, for site visits or for uh, taking them to households who have been impacted by federal housing programs so that the members of Congress can see that these investments and these resources truly do make a difference in the communities that they represent. Now, of course, the coronavirus pandemic has made a lot of people um, uh, skittish, nervous, or sensibly um, holding back on any in-person events. But as more and more people are being vaccinated and as coronavirus infection rates are stabilizing in many places, uh, some groups and organizations have been willing to do uh, some in-person interaction as long as they're following the appropriate CDC guidance and their own uh, standards for safety. Uh, so tomorrow with the follow-up notes from this call, we'll distribute some guidance that we have on putting together strong and effective um, in-district meetings. Um, we have, um, we, we encourage those of you who are doing those meetings to use the talking points uh, that we have for the House campaign and to take a look at the fact sheet for the Build Back Better Act. Um, and of course, uh, we are available to answer any questions if you're not sure if your member of Congress is one of the um, targeted uh, moderate members of Congress. Um, please reach out to us uh, at outreach at nlihc.org or just reach out to any of us on the field team uh, and we can help you as you are potentially putting together your meeting. Of course, we're focusing on that now because the House and Senate both will be in recess uh, for much of the next two months because of the holidays. And while they are in, re in recess, which they uh, strongly prefer to refer to as in-district work period, um, they do take a lot of meetings. And sometimes this is the best way uh, for you 
to meet with your member of Congress and really capture their attention. So um, we encourage that as a, as a manner of getting through to your members of Congress over the next couple of weeks. Um, so I would like to turn it over now to uh, Ariel Nelson, who's here with us from the National Consumer Law Center and is going to talk a little bit about some uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau actions on consumer reporting uh, that is very relevant to so many renters. So Ariel, please take it away. Thanks so much, Joey, and for having me. So um, as Joey mentioned, um, I'm going to be talking about this advisory opinion that was issued by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the CFPB. And um, for those of you who follow them less closely, an advisory opinion is essentially a sub-regulatory piece of guidance. It's not, doesn't have the same effect as a regulation, but it can certainly have an impact on um, the behavior of uh, different actors in the industry, which I will get into a little bit later. Um, and I should have some slides, if you wouldn't mind going to the next one, please. And the next one too, thank you. So um, I wanna start by saying what the top, line, the top line holding of the advisory opinion is, and then we'll step back and do a little bit of background. So the, advisory opinion affirms that consumer reporting agencies, which includes tenant screening companies and other sorts of background screening companies, violate the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which is a federal statute, if they use something called name-only matching or other insufficient matching procedures to match, to match information to a consumer. Next slide, please. And Let's dive a little bit into what all of that jargon means. So as I'm sure many of you know, the vast majority of landlords use tenant screening reports that they purchase from third party background screening companies to determine whether to accept a rental applicant. And these reports often include credit history, residential history, employment status, criminal history, and eviction records. And the CFPB's um, advisory opinion focuses on this one type of practice that is used to match an individual with a record or other information, and it is name only matching. And that is the matching of the information of, a, of the consumer who is the subject of say the tenant screening report based only on whether the consumer's first and last names are identical identical or similar to the names associated with the information. And I, it's really important here to, to the line similar to the names associated with the information because a lot of what companies have done um, is not just first and last name, but also variations on first and last name. So if your name is Robert Smith, it, you could be matched to a record based on Bob Smith, Bobby Smith, Roberta, Roberta Smith. So all of these things, all these techniques are used. It's called fuzzy matching logic sometimes. And one thing in terms of context is important to know is that these companies, con consumer reporting agencies, which include, like I mentioned, background screening companies and tenant screening companies are regulated by the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act. And this advisory opinion relates specifically to one particular provision, which is the requirement that when they are preparing a consumer report, a consumer reporting agency has to follow reasonable procedures to assure maximum possible information. And so all of this advisory opinion is using that framework to say, name only matching violates this particular provision of the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And I wanna talk mostly about why this advisory opinion matters. Uh, next slide, if you wouldn't mind. So shoddy matching practices, including name only matching practices, often lead to tenant screening reports that contain criminal history information, sex offender registry information, terrorist watch list, the OFAC list information, and the eviction records of somebody else. And as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, those types of records often lead to denials of housing. And it's particularly harmful because sometimes even if a 
potential renter is able to get the information on their tenant screening report corrected, it might be too late. They might have already lost the apartment. So it's pretty, it's really important to get the information right up front. And one thing that the CFPB highlighted throughout this opinion is that name only matching is especially harmful for certain communities of color, Hispanic, Black, and Asian communities in particular, because there is less surname diversity in those populations. And that in turn means that name only matching reinforces and exacerbates racial disparities in access to affordable housing. And the advisory opinion um, cited to a number of, of, of studies showing that that's the case in case that's useful for anyone else's um, advocacy or research. Um, and two other things that I wanted to mention are one, the CFPB has a consumer complaint database and already uh, consumer complaints about inaccurate information on reports is the largest percentage of complaints regarding consumer reporting. So we know that inaccurate um, consumer reports are a big deal. And the CFPB specifically expressed concern that the risk of harm, the risk of these errors could be heightened because there are there is much more negative information in the consumer reporting system arising out of the pandemic. Um, and that could be things like eviction records. We, thanks to the advocacy of many of you, the um, tidal wave of evictions is maybe not yet upon us, but we know that there are certainly gaps. There had been gaps in the eviction moratoriums and that tidal wave could still be coming. So there is going to be a lot, there are gonna be a lot of public records that could potentially be inaccurately matched to consumers, making it even more difficult for them to get affordable housing and get back on their feet in the wake of the pandemic. Next slide, please. There is also a really useful um, note about data brokers in this advisory opinion. Um, a lot of times consumer reporting agencies, including tenant screening companies, will get their public records information from, a, information from a third party, like a data broker or some other kind of vendor. And the CFPB clarifies that it is not a reasonable procedure to just take that information from sources like that without taking additional steps to verify that information. And that could uh, mean looking at other databases or mean looking at ad additional personal identifiers, not just first and last name, but things like date of birth, maybe gender, maybe um, address, things like that. Social security number, if available. Next slide, please. And this advisory opinion is focused primarily, as I've said, on the particularly terrible practice of name only matching, which is so egregious that the CFPB is just coming out and saying that practice standing alone is unlawful. But we've seen there are statements from Director Chopra and from the advisory opinion itself saying that just because you use some more identify pieces of identifying information doesn't necessarily mean you're complying with the statute. And I, I won't read these quotes, but they're there in, in case you want to skim them. Um, and that's particularly important because although we've seen the use of name only matching by some of these companies, particularly in the terrorist watch list context and the sex offender registry context, um, some companies might use more identifiers. They might use first and last name and date of birth, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's enough. And so this can be good ammunition um, going forward for companies that still use insufficient matching practices, but aren't, aren't actually just using name only. Next slide, please. And uh, the last sort of top line thing about why this advisory opinion matters that I want to highlight is it signals a continued focus on the background screening industry and its abuses by the CFPB and also the FTC. It, sig it says uh, that the press release surrounding the advisory opinion highlighted that the CFPB and the FTC are going to be working together. Um, and I think that's both in terms of looking at the practices in the industry and also potentially bringing enforcement actions against background screening companies who aren't compliant. Um, and I, I say continued focus on this slide because in July, we also saw a piece of subregulatory guidance from the CFPB about rental reporting and the reporting of things like rental debt and eviction records. And so 
Um, and we've also seen the CFPB issue a lot of consumer facing tools about how to find resources um, like emergency rental assistance. And so I think that these are all signals that these federal agencies and the CFPB in particular are really focusing on this industry and how it's harming consumers. Next slide, please. And I just want to highlight a couple of the ideal outcomes of this, especially, you know, if we're thinking, well, sub-regulatory guidance, what does that even mean? Does that affect behavior at all? Um, we are hopeful that it will change the behavior of tenant screening companies. We've heard in the past that this type of agency guidance can really scare companies and encourage them to comply more with the law. Um, and we hope that in turn, that means that um, there are fewer denials of housing for folks. Um, and you know that would be because their tenant screening reports are more accurate. There's sort of a, I think we hope that ultimately if a company determines that it can't accurately match a record, it might not be willing to report it. I think that might be a little more pie in the sky um, hope because unfortunately housing providers, I think would rather see a, a tenant screening report that's over-inclusive rather than under-inclusive. Um, but you know, strong statements by agencies like these certainly suggest that companies should be afraid of using shoddy matching practices and getting inaccurate results. Um, the last two things I'll mention are one, that guidance like this strengthens the litigation position of tenants. If there is a screening company that has um, shoddy matching practices, uh, the litigant is certainly in a better position to argue that that's unlawful. Um, and I, secondly, we hope that it increases accountability. As I mentioned, the CFPB and the FTC are are um, signaling that they would will go off after companies for non-compliance and they have in the past and it seems like that will only continue. Um, so we will have to see what comes of it and it's it was only issued last week so there haven't we haven't heard too much yet but hopefully we'll be getting will be we will begin to see the effects of this soon. And I will stop there. All right, thanks so much for that really important update and that excellent information, Ariel. Uh, we do have a couple of questions coming in. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, first, Maxwell in Louisiana is asking, um, under the new CFPB guidance, can a landlord using name-only matching software be held liable, um, or is it only the screening companies that carry liability? So if we're talking about the Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, you would be going after the tenant screening company under the particular provision of the Fair Credit Reporting Act that I mentioned, the accuracy provision. Um, there might, depending on what state you're in, there might be a way to also go after the landlord. Um, but this guidance, I, I think, is really aimed at accountability for the screening companies themselves. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another question came in about, uh, does any organization or does the CFPB have data on um, the number of, of renters or households who have been denied housing uh, because of erroneous information? Um, or do we just have anecdotes? That's a great question. Um, so there was a study by the FTC that came out in 2012 that was about accuracy in traditional credit reports. And that has been a hugely important study because it shows how just how inaccurate they are. There has not been an equivalent study in the background screening context, though some of us have been pushing that we need that kind of information to be able to point to. Um, so I would say it's mostly, it is mostly anecdotal or, you know, sometimes from litigation, you can pull out the information that these companies have reported in terms of their own error rates and kind of back back into figuring out how many errors that actually implies. And usually it's it's quite a few. Um, so yeah, there unfortunately in this space, we don't have any industry-wide data showing that. That's very helpful. Uh, Marie in Oregon asks, um, how would tenants know if this is the reason for their denial, if they were denied because of shoddy vetting or the name only matching. Um, I know in many states, uh, tenants aren't don't have the right to know why they were denied. Also a great question. Um, so under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, when you are denied housing, you are supposed to get what's called an adverse action notice. 
and it will say the name of the background screening company that was used and their information. And the consumer has the ability to then request what's called their file from that background screening company. And they are not required to under the federal statute, but a um, the tenant screening company could just give the tenant a copy of the report that a landlord uses. And we've heard that some companies do do that. Um, and, you know, it, it's not a surefire way to figure out why you're denied, but if you got a copy of your report, which we highly recommend, you could see that someone's criminal or eviction record is on there that has a completely different person's name. We've seen examples where the name bears almost no similarity to the actual person. Um, and so in that case, it would could be clearer. Um, but you're right that because the landlord doesn't have to say why they denied you, it is not always obvious. I will also say that there are some state laws and certainly some proposed state laws um, that would require landlords to give a reason for denial. And so hopefully, you know, that will change over time. It will be easier for tenants to know why they were denied. And therefore, if it's as a result of an accuracy, an, an inaccuracy issue for them to address that. Uh, thank you so much, Ariel, for that clarification. We need to move on now in our agenda, but I invite you to please uh, stick around and take a look at the chat box. There are a lot of other uh, questions and notes and comments in there. Um, and if you can uh, reply to some of those, I think uh, people would be really grateful, but we really appreciate you having being with us today. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much. All right, uh, I would like to turn now to our next panelist. Uh, we are delighted to have with us Tim Thomas from the Urban Displacement Project at the University of California. Uh, and Tim will be talking a little bit about uh, their project's housing precarity risk model. And Tim, if you would, please take it away, sir. Thanks so much, Joey. And it's a real pleasure and honor to be here. I was here last August uh, presenting the first uh, findings of this research. I just put in the chat a link to the project itself. And uh, if I could move on to the next slide, please. Uh, the housing precarity risk model uh, is largely a project that we developed out of the need to try and understand uh, overall housing precarity in the United States due to eviction and displacement and the intersection with unemployment. So largely what the housing precarity risk model does is that it covers those three issues, but it highlights areas that particularly have high numbers of households that are at risk of long-term poverty, eviction, and displacement. We released it on June 28th. We're continuing to work on updates with it as we collect more data, better data, better estimates. And um, I would say that these maps are very conservative estimates because we're basing a lot of information on uh, different statistics that aren't totally complete. When I, when I teach statistics, I always tell my students all statistics are wrong, but some are useful. So I tend to think that this is on the useful side of things. Uh, largely what the precarity model uh, is trying to define is how resilient households are to economic and environmental shocks. So what we do is we measure pre-pandemic displacement and eviction risk, and we intersect that with the 2020 pandemic unemployment rate across 53 metropolitan areas with over a million people. Each metro tract receives a precarity score or each community receives a score between zero to nine, where zero is low precarity uh, in the middle between like five and four is higher precarity. And then on upwards are the highest precarious neighborhoods. Uh, overall, we see that 41% of all households live in high eviction or displacement risk neighborhoods across our 53 metros. 52% of all renters live in high eviction or displacement risk neighborhoods. And what's particularly troubling is how uh, precarity falls along racial lines. 73% of all black renters live in high eviction or displacement risk neighborhoods. Here's a list of the top 10 most precarious neighborhoods, uh, Las Vegas being number one because they were hardest hit with unemployment. However, uh, what I'll show here in a minute is how ERA distributions, eviction rental assistance distribution, distributions compare. Las Vegas actually has about a 77% distribution rate, which is probably one of the highest in the country. The average though with ERA one, which was from January to July was about 16% distribution for different metros. So areas like New Orleans are really struggling with that. 
uh, Detroit, uh, Providence, Rhode Island, Buffalo, New York, Memphis, Tennessee, Cleveland, Philadelphia, New York, and finally Los Angeles is in the top 10. Of course, our website has a list of all of the uh, measures and you can actually look at a uh, Google Sheet spreadsheet and see if your metro is on there and kind of look at some of the numbers that we've put together. So uh, since I presented this in August, we've been able to look at actual eviction data and kind of see how our model uh, compares to what's been going on, what we predicted, were we right, were we wrong? And about 70% of, uh, this is just on a subsample of some counties where we got current eviction filing rates, we were about 70%, uh, 71% as expected. About 24% of counties that we looked at were over our expectation. And only about 4% of the counties that we looked at were actually under our expectation. Now, mind you, local moratoriums, local policies have a massive impact on this. So we were um, sadly enthused that our model was right, but very depressed about how much precarity is actually in the US this time. Uh, I compared ERA distributions, eviction rental assistance. This is from January to July and our HPRMs. Um, and this is a list of our 53. This is kind of a complex graph, but by and large, uh, most of the areas that are, you know, Las Vegas is up here at the top, New Orleans second, like I had mentioned, San Jose is at the very bottom. All those, that kind of faint dashed line right there is the average distribution. Most of our metros are a bit above. So we can see on average, we're sitting around 20 to 30% of ERA distributions uh, occurring. But however, there are a lot of areas that we observe that have below average or below national average ERA distributions, particularly uh, New Orleans, uh, Providence again, Buffalo, Memphis, Cleveland, New York, Rochester, New York, um, Cincinnati, Atlanta, Indianapolis, Portland, Minnesota, Columbus, Birmingham, Nashville, Kansas, Jacksonville, and San Jose. Uh, so there, you know, this is something that's very concerning that if there is high precarity in some of these areas that the rental assistance is not coming out. I also looked at how, what's the performance of evictions uh, for different counties. So the theory is this, that counties that had very high eviction rates prior to the pandemic, do they still have very high rates relatively to the current eviction filing process? In other words, all evictions have been down, but they're sitting floating around 60 to 80% of historical averages. Some though have 160% of historical averages, but basically, you know, what can we expect to see? In other words, what I found is that the counties that when we look at pre-pandemic eviction rates, their eviction rate is relatively similar to current eviction rates. In other words, those who were higher victors or before the pandemic are high victors now. Not too surprising, but this is something to help you all to understand the, the need. If you know that an area is evicting a lot, you can basically assume, or they had evicted a lot in prior times, they're still evicting a lot now. So we have a huge list of policy and recommendations on our website at urbandisplacement.org. And before I finish, I wanted to kind of uh, talk a little bit about what we're seeing right now. Um, right now, like I said, eviction uh, rates are below historical average, but frustratingly, they're starting to increase to at, uh, at average possibly. We're unsure if that it's going to actually increase to that level or not, when it will. But one of my biggest concerns, I have several actually, one is that we're coming up on the holiday season. Christmas for some reason has always been uh, one of the top periods across the year when evictions occur. So I'm expecting that there's going to be a spike, particularly along the holiday season. I've also been talking to a lot of legal services uh, aid uh, areas and different metros. A lot of them are hitting max capacity already. So uh, they've been staying evictions and a lot of landlords have not been evicting because they know they can't because of local moratoriums or the CDC moratorium. That effort's probably going to increase by landlords to start evicting more and legal services are reaching max capacity already. 
So this is kind of leading to a bit of a storm uh, coming up. And we also know that local moratoriums are the most effective at staying evictions. And unfortunately, a lot of local moratoriums are ending. And finally, there's been a lot of evidence uh, anecdotally that people have been, uh, they've been threatened by landlords before the notice and actually leaving. There's no way to measure this, but that to me may be a much, much higher rate of eviction than what we see in the filing rate. So the pandemic has fundamentally changed a lot of things and it's gonna take us a while to really understand what happened. But as we can expect, or what we should expect is a bit of an increase and in hopefully uh, press everyone that you know in legislation to really consider this because the turn, you know, evictions have been kind of falling off the radar just a little bit. And I think that we really need to push forward and try to address this more now. So I'll stop there. Thank you for your time. Really appreciate the invitation. Thanks so much, Tim, for that excellent presentation. I'll start you off with a simple question, which is, um, how are you for this particular tool measuring evictions? Uh, is this the beginning of an action? Uh, is this at the issue, issuance of, a, of an eviction execution? Um, what point are you selecting as uh, when an eviction is taking place? Uh, this is a question from, from Laura Massey. Great question. Um, so Right now, uh, between like the Eviction Lab and Legal Services Corporation, the two groups that are covering most of evictions across the United States, they only cover about 40% of all counties in the United States. And areas like the West Coast are near uh, unknown because of various reasons. Data is just very difficult to get at. So what we did is, and this is why it's a conservative estimate, we're looking at the number of eviction uh, lockouts. So there are three points of information data that you can get the notice, the filing and the lockout. The notice is always gonna be a lot higher in, in number, but it's unclear like whether or not someone moved, but people move or, or are evicted across these three data points. We look at the very last one, which is very unfortunate. So this is why I consider it a conservative estimate. Then we took all the data we threw uh, over a hundred variables related to eviction and, and use what we call a Bayesian additive regression tree. It's a very fancy statistic, uses machine learning, and you can throw a lot of information at it to look and see what variables predict eviction. So for example, in any iteration that we did, percent black was the number one predictor. So what was the level of percent black in a neighborhood? The percent of uh, households with females that are uh, with children, uh, seniors, low rent, those were some of the top variables that came out of, out of these hundreds of variables. The rest of them didn't really matter. So we measured those levels and then applied a score based on how high each of those important levels were across this area. So again, this is a very conservative estimate, uh, but it is basically you know, all the variables that you and I full well know that contribute to long-term poverty housing instability and all those things too. We're hoping to improve it and, and get more accuracy using filings and other uh, data too, but it's, it's, it's been a you know, long process. Thanks, Tim. Um, another question that's come in in a couple of different ways is, as you went through your slides, it seemed like some of the data points in terms of this community is doing well or this community is doing poorly might not have matched with the local experience of some of the people on the call. Are there things that might explain why your data might be um, uh, incongruous with what people are observing? Absolutely. I highly encourage that, you know, like I said, all statistics are wrong, but some are useful. We're on the useful end of things to double check this at the ground level. Are we right or are we wrong? And um, I think that, you know, it's been helpful for some cities because they're now seeing this precarity that they didn't see. But there are definitely areas that we uh, don't predict enough precarity. And that's an issue. That's a huge issue. And we, we are very adamant on highlighting that. Local policies play a huge role. Local moratoriums play a huge role in suppressing that. Also, the level of aggressiveness of landlords. Certain states have very strong landlord lobbies, and they tend to try to weaken a lot of the tenant protections. And so uh, there will be a lot of variation in terms of what we see. Um, but I'd be more than happy to talk if anyone has, uh, we have a feedback form. If you see something that's wrong on that webpage, go to that form, 
highlight the area that you think is wrong, that helps us improve this model. So please, please feel free to reach out uh, through that form or reach out to me uh, via email. I'd be very happy to talk to everyone. Uh, Tim, I think we have to move along now in our agenda, but this has been excellent information. Uh, there are a few more things in the Q&A box and in the chat box. I'd love it if you could take a look at and perhaps respond to uh, before you leave, uh, but really appreciate you joining us and really appreciate uh, this important and impactful work that you're doing at the Urban Displacement Project. Thank you. All right, and uh, next up is uh, a presenter sort of a, on a similar topic, still talking a lot about um, evictions and some of what we're seeing taking place in communities throughout the nation. Uh, we're happy to have with us Juan Pablo, Juan Pablo Garnum uh, from Eviction Lab to talk a little bit about what they're seeing in terms of evictions in undocumented communities. Uh, so Juan Pablo, I'd like to turn it over to you, sir. Hi everyone, thanks for the opportunity. Yes, my name is Juan Pablo Garnam and I'm the audience and community engagement editor for the Eviction Lab. I'm also a journalist and I have worked in housing, immigration and urban affairs for a while. And today I, I wanna tell you a little bit about uh, this project that we're just starting. So this is very early uh, stages uh, that it's about uh, undocumented communities and evictions. So more than 10 million undocumented immigrants live in, in the United States. It's a population that is larger than New Jersey's, right? Um, but their experience about eviction and housing challenges is remains very invisible compared to the average American tenant. And um, many of you in this call probably know uh, some part of this issue. And, and the challenges um, that, that, that we have. We hear of irregular evictions or, or that never appear in the data, harassment and discrimination due to the tenant's immigration status and all sorts of barriers accessing justice and rental assistance. So I wanted to talk to you today because we're working on this project to collect stories of undocumented tenants that were evicted before or after court or, that, or tenants that, that risk eviction. Uh, we know their experience is very different, and there are many cases uh, where, uh, where they are more vulnerable than the average tenant. We've conducted so far informal conversations with advocates, legal experts, immigration experts, and this is kind of what they've been telling us so far. Uh, first, um, that there's harassment and discrimination by landlords uh, who use immigration status to get away with the regular evictions. Uh, but housing conditions and other abuses. Some advocates actually told us that some landlords cater specifically to undocumented families as a business model. Um, then there's the issue of language barriers that limit their capacity to negotiate and understand their rights. Uh, and we were even told that uh, there are cases when, where, where children are the intermediary with the landlord. Um, there's a issue obviously of fear of deportation and the hope of regularizing their immigration status at some point. Uh, and that can affect their thinking about accessing benefits, reaching out for help, and their relationship with government in general. Um, we were also told that there's uh, sometimes unwillingness to self-advocate, either because of fear of being called on uh, immigration authorities or lack of understanding of the public charge rules, thinking that um, you know uh, asking for something might uh, actually jeopardize their chance of regularizing their status. And in general, an overall feeling that the landlord is doing a favor to them by giving them housing. And also another issue that came out in these conversations is the is invisibility of the housing challenges in general. Um, undocumented immigrants tend to solve their problems on their own and act in the realm of informality. And we see things like lack of con contracts, overcrowding. Of course, there's multi-generational households, which can be a good thing, but also has some challenges. And um, to promote kind of policies that address all of this, we need more research. So in my conversations, I heard several times that better legislation is very difficult to, to, to promote without research and without data to prove it. Um, so the main reason that I wanted to talk to you all today is that we want your help. Um, first, uh, we want to ask you uh, to first reach out to me. You have there in, in the slide my information, my, my phone number, my email, my Twitter account. I'm also on LinkedIn. Uh, and you can con communicate with me and help me with feedback on, for example, what kind of questions should we be asking? Uh, how to ask this question? Is there anyone else working on similar issues? Should I read anything? 
uh, that you've seen. We want to hear from you. And second, and maybe maybe the most important and more biggest challenge is that we need help from organizations like all of yours uh, to reach out undocumented tenants that might feel um, initially uncomfortable of telling their story, but hopefully we can get to to a point uh, where they, they can feel comfortable to tell us their stories. I'm a reporter, I've done stories about this and, and, and I know that this last part is gonna be a big challenge. Um, undocumented tenants have really good reasons to not be willing to talk, but we want to create a safe space and, and an ethical way to get their stories, to learn more about their experiences and, and also put this issue on the public debate. So that's it on my side. I'm, I'm very happy to, to answer questions or connect with people later and there you go you have all my information um thank you so much for your time sorry about that i was muted um thank you so much from juan pablo for this excellent excellent information and um one question i'd like to ask is um how does the information that was previously shared by tim about uh the housing precarity model um impact in your mind uh some of what you're seeing in undocumented communities I mean, uh, it's 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 uh, it's something that I, I think I need to to explore it a little bit better. I think it would be good to actually connect with Tim. It's one of the things that I'm that I'm trying to do. Uh, one of the one of the main things that we want to do. I think I don't have a, a direct answer to it right now. But one of the things that we want to do is be uh, very representative of the of the different experiences of undocumented tenants, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a map like the one that he creates will be very helpful for that because we have um, play, uh, experiences, for example, of people in, in you know, uh, a sanctuary city in, in a blue state that might be pretty um, open and helpful um, uh, advertising the different benefits that are out there and that uh, having no papers, it's not gonna be a problem. Uh, you see that in New York, San Francisco, but then you would have like places that are, for example, cities that live out of like a meatpacking factory where in a red state where, where people might feel so much more um, uncomfortable about reaching out or going to a court, for example. So, so the work that he does, uh, also the work that my colleagues at the lab have done, help us kind of like look at how many people would should get from and how uh, like from different places and try to try to cover all of these different experiences because of course like the the immigrant experience and the and, and being undocumented varies a lot depending on where you are in this country thanks uh so much for those thoughts i will ask you were talking about um storytelling during your presentation and nathan reader asked um have you talked to landlords and what um have there been any surprises or have there really been um, sort of shocking and appalling stories from their perspective or do they just avoid talking to you at all? My, my, my experience so far I, in, in the this previous early stage, I haven't reached out to landlords yet. I have some experience talking to landlords um, as a reporter when I would cover um, stories in Texas. I think the, the experience also about landlords, it's, it varies a lot, you know? You have some landlords that are very collaborative, that work with their, with their um, community, that know that, that their community is more vulnerable, and, and others that normally are the, tries, the ones that try to avoid um, reporters like me, um, that, that actually um, are a little bit more uh, aggressive or, or even could be, um, um preying on 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 undocumented communities so that varies so much and 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 this is like part of what we want to know right like the first stage i guess will be talking to the tenants and then it would be great if we can start talking to landlords too so that we can get like a full the full perspective on this well, thanks for all this information, Juan Pablo. It's really been great. Um, please do, as I've said to other presenters, uh, spend a moment looking at the chat box and the Q&A box to see if there's anything you can respond to. Uh, if you look in the chat box, you'll see that Zoe Middleton in Texas has posted a, a very enthusiastic support for your work. Um, and I think we all share that. So thanks so much. And uh, I will turn now to the next part of our agenda. Thank you. And so we will move on to uh, field updates. And I am... Uh, James Williams from Fair Share Housing Center in New Jersey. Do we have you with us here? Yes, hi, Joey, I'm here. 
Oh, James, great. Um, so glad we have you. Um, you uh, have some excellent uh, updates about what's going on in New Jersey. And so I'm just going to let you take it away uh, if you can. Oh, thank you. Uh, apologies for my camera being off. Um, I failed in my negotiations with my six-year-old today. So um, my day got a little away from me. But um, uh, welcome all. Um, bringing you greetings from Fresher Housing Center, New Jersey. Um, this past summer, we had the, uh, the honor and the privilege of, of working with legislators to get um, the first housing um, criminal background check discrimination bill, the most comprehensive one signed um, in the country here in New Jersey, a statewide bill. Um, that bill is titled the, uh, the Fair Chance in Housing Act. It will uh, remove the criminal background check component from initial applications. Um, it is uh, crafted to be a tiered look back system. Um, so New Jersey has uh, four indictable offenses. So fourth degree indictable offenses will be a six year look back. Second and third will be a four year look back and first degree indictable offenses will only be um, a one year look back. Um, that is a substantial change as many of you know to the unlimited amount of time that some landlords and developers use um, and in some cases, you could find uh, 10, 15, uh, 20 year look backs as, as a standard. One of the other components that we thought was extremely, extremely important in our bill was going to be the enforcement and the data collection that many, um, many of you have um, articulated. There aren't a lot of databases, there, there isn't a lot of information around uh, some of the pieces of, of, of statistics that we're looking for. Um, so, um, in that regard, um, are under the Attorney General's office here in New Jersey, uh, the Division on Civil Rights will be um, the enforcement agency as well as the data collection agency. Um, so these cases won't be looked into by housing authorities, but by a law enforcement agency. Um, so for that reason, um, we're really excited that this bill has the opportunity to do exactly what many of us have been discussing actually start to create a data pool so we can actually identify how many individuals are being discriminated or denied housing from this particular issue. Um, this is a really important issue in New Jersey. Um, we lead the nation in racial disparities for incarceration, um, 12, 12 and a half now to one that actually increased to 12 and a half to one um, for black to whites that are incarcerated. We also lead the nation in youth um, incarceration, um, black to white, um, a huge racial disparity as it pertains to uh, the racial wealth gap here in New Jersey. So there's a lot of racial issues um, that we believe intersect in, um, into housing. Um, access to housing is, uh, is, a, is a fundamental right. Um, at Fair Share Housing, we have, well, in, in New Jersey, we have a historic piece of legislation um, called our Mount Laurel Doctrine. Um, it is a municipal mandate for every municipality in New Jersey to have affordable housing. Um, our next phase in our work is not only to ensure that we have the right amount of affordable housing built, but now the appropriate people need to ensure, we need to ensure that we have access to that affordable housing. Um, and particularly in, in most states, you have a disproportionate amount of black and brown communities that are on the lower end of the wealth gap. So having access to housing, recognizing that there's an unfortunate intersection between earning potential in this country and criminalization, um, we need to try to reduce one barrier so that we can allow these other opportunities um, to come full circle for these communities. So um, we're really, really excited about this bill. Um, we know that this is not um, the end. Um, for many of you, I'm certain you're aware of Seattle um, is what we would consider to be the gold standard. They've completely removed it from their housing applications. So they've decoupled housing with the criminal justice system. That's what we're, our goal is to get towards. But we think that this is a step in, um, changing the narrative on, on what that looks like, and two, having this identified and being enforced behind law enforcement and not just around housing agencies that would get fines or, or some kind of uh, sanction, but actually being investigated, looked after, and, and being called by the Attorney General's office. And I think that that brings a significant amount of weight to these situations where um, housing providers and developers are no longer brushing these phone calls off, but they're actually um, being looked into by by a law enforcement agency that's going to actually collect this data so that we can come back in a couple of years if we need to and say hey we tried to do it by removing it from the initial application this issue is so pervasive 
the only the only natural course ahead is to completely take this component off a of housing application so that people can have a fair and equitable chance at housing. So um, we're really excited about it. It was signed into, into law on Juneteenth, um, the first observed day of Juneteenth here in the state of New Jersey, when, and will go in effect um, January of 2022. So we're currently working with um, the Division on Civil Rights on regulations. Well, we're providing comments for the regulations, um, just trying our best to ensure that the implementation and the rollout is as seamless and as um, effective as possible. To, to, to going back to everyone's point, access to housing is going to be at a premium moving forward. Um, and if criminal records are one tool that some are utilizing to um, marginalize certain communities, um, then we wanna do our best to ensure that as housing is being built, that the right people have access to the housing. Thanks so much for this update, James. Um, I've got a couple of questions that have come into the Q&A box in the chat. The first one is a simple one. Um, does the Fair Chance and Housing Act apply only to affordable housing or to all housing? Uh, in New Jersey, uh, all housing. Okay, great. Good to know. Um, also, you mentioned that it goes into effect in January. I'm wondering if in terms of implementation of the new law, there are any implications from the most recent elections in New Jersey um, that raise any concerns for you? Uh, thankfully, uh, no. Uh, all, all things are still um, concrete, if that's even a possibility in, in terms of any of our local or national politics, but everything in terms of that are still in place. So we're, we're looking forward with, uh, with, with its rollout in January. Okay, great. Uh, Dozier Hammond asked the question, uh, what about the creditworthiness bill? Is that something that your organization is tracking as well? Absolutely. So there is a, um, a bill that is currently in committee here in the state, uh, credit, uh, credit worthiness bill attached to affordable housing that we are looking to, to make the next step in this continuum of, of in, in just in, in our line of issues to address as it pertains to affordable how, um, access to housing, criminal background checks, credit history, eviction filings, social lawful income, um, we think are gonna be really, really critical um, areas to address. So uh, to that point, yes, credit worthiness is in our radar and we are currently working with the uh, sponsor of the bill to, to see what we have to do to, to move it forward into, um, into the next legislative session. So the Fair Chance and Housing Act is a tremendous achievement and well done, excellent work. Um, but you mentioned that the gold standard is really in Seattle. Um, I'm wondering, do you have a sense of how, if there are many other states that have gone even further than your recent bill, um, or are you under the impression that, that New Jersey is doing well comparatively? I know uh, Renee Mitchell has raised in the chat at several points that in New York, uh, it's really difficult for people who have criminal records to find housing. Yeah, absolutely. So, so right now we we think that we're um, we're doing we're ahead of the curve um, as it pertains to our progress here in the state. Now there are a lot of cities, um, and let me be clear: there are a lot of individual cities, municipalities that have had have that have done this. But I'm certain, as many of you know, that getting statewide um, mm -hmm. legislation like this passed is extremely, extremely difficult, just because of the the dynamics and the, the, the geography difference that exists in, in all of our states. So this is the first statewide bill. Now there are others, there are other states that have done uh, similar pieces, but none, uh, none have the enforcement components that we were able to get into ours and the, um, and the data collection coming from that law enforcement agency. So we think that the, the, the way that the bill is structured with the law enforcement component and the data collection makes this bill kind of in, in rarefied air. So having basically the attorney general's office being the one that is going to enforce it really makes this bill really unique. Thanks so much for this excellent update, James, and thank you for joining us. Uh, as I've said to other presenters, please take a look at the Q&A box and the chat box to see if there are additional questions that you might be able to chime in on. Um, but we really appreciate hearing from you today. Um, I'd like to turn now to our next field update from uh, Han Hannah Adams, who is a staff attorney at Southeast Louisiana Legal Services. Um, as many of you know, uh, in order for our campaign to achieve universal, stable, affordable housing, that applies also to the many people who find themselves displaced after a major disaster. And in Southeast Louisiana, they're having some concerning interactions with FEMA, and Hannah's going to talk a little bit about um, what they're doing to try to get to better solutions. Hannah, take it away. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's an honor to get to speak on this call. Uh, my name is Hannah Adams. I'm a staff attorney 
in the litigation and advocacy unit at Southeast Louisiana Legal Services. We're the free civil legal aid agency that serves um, the majority of the southeastern portion of the state. And um, pretty much all of our parishes in our service area were impacted by Hurricane Ida. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the problems we've encountered since Ida um, and specifically some of the issues we've uh, dealt with with FEMA and a couple of the um, initiatives we're working on in response. Um, and I'm going to try to um, I'm going to try to keep this to, to three to five minutes, but someone flag me down if I go over. Um, so as everybody knows, uh, the, we got our disaster declaration for Hurricane Ida on August 26, which um, probably everyone on this call also remembers as the glorious day when the Supreme Court struck down the CPC moratorium. So folks down here had a um, second disaster on top of a first disaster. Um, the storm hit on August 29th, um, uh, of course, the anniversary of Hurricane Katrina as a category four storm, and it only hit about uh, 30 to 40 miles west of New Orleans. Um, thank thankfully, we did not have a uh, catastrophic flooding event like we did in Katrina, um, but but we did uh, sustain serious uh, wind damage, and especially in some of the hardest hit areas um, closer to the eye of the storm, um, there was a very, very, very severe property damage. Um, we also experienced the complete failure of our electrical grid. Um, the Metro New Orleans area lost power for between one and two weeks. Um, and so a lot of folks were not able to return for an extended period of time due to not having um, power. So after the storm, we encountered sort of two categories of housing problems. Um, the first was that we uh, began getting a lot of calls from tenants whose landlords decided that this storm would be a perfect opportunity to do what they'd been trying to do for a year, which is um, evict their tenants. Um, we actually, I should step back and say, we got a, te a very temporary reprieve from the end of the eviction moratorium because the governor issued essentially a suspension of all legal deadlines for a month after the storm, just due to um, um, the inability of people to uh, get home and, and participate in legal processes. Um, so uh, we had landlords who, um, you know, after that time period expired, attempted to evict people um, because of storm damage that may or may not actually exist. Um, we uh, ran into a problem where we found that um, a lot of uh, landlords and tenants, but also a lot of courts were kind of unfamiliar with the um, code articles um, and uh, case law governing when uh, a landlord can evict due to storm damage. And actually our state law draws a distinction between a situation where a property is totally destroyed um, and a property that is uh, partially destroyed in terms of whether the landlord has a right to evict or whether the landlord simply has a right to uh, temporarily displace while they make repairs. The one thing we worked on um, that, I mean, it's very state specific, but I'm happy to share it as a template if anyone's interested. We uh, created a bench card um, in collaboration with our uh, local bar, Louisiana State Bar Association, and also with input from a number of uh, local judges across the state. Um, and uh, it just sort of went through the basic uh, framework in the law for how to handle these um, these types of post-storm issues, keeping in mind that a lot of evictions, probably the majority of evictions in the state are actually handled by justices of the peace who may not have any formal legal training. So the second problem we encountered and the one that I'll focus on more today is um, the people who are were displaced after the storm because of um, actual uh, severe storm damage. Um, and as you might suspect, um, obviously we had people who uh, in our service area who live closer to where the storm hit um, in Terrebonne and lower uh, Lafouche parishes. Um, and uh, those folks, um, regardless of the condition of their property before the storm, uh, often sustain serious damage. Much, many of our staff members also sustain serious damage. And then we also have a huge um, portion of our uh, low-income uh, renter population living in substandard rental housing. Uh, and that was substandard prior to Ida. And of course, um, when you hit uh, substandard rental housing stock with a category four uh, storm with category four level winds, what's gonna happen, <laughs> the, the property uh, falls into even worse uh, disrepair. Um, so we ended up with um, a lot of tenants who, you know, they had a, a, a leak before the storm, ceiling collapsed in the storm. I have one client who had a recurring uh, plumbing defect in her property before the storm that was never adequately addressed. And, um, you know, then after the storm, uh, 
she has no usable bathroom in her home. So we see a lot of that too um, in the absence of um, a, a frankly a functional code enforcement system um, that protects tenants. Um, we currently have a code enforcement system where tenants have to call to make complaints. There's no uh, requirement to get your property inspected before you rent it or get any kind of occupancy permit for renting. Um, so the result is that because there's no protection against retaliation, a lot of times these um, sort of systemic uh, repair issues go unaddressed for years or even decades because um, a tenant who is um, not protected from retaliation is gonna be afraid to call code enforcement. So um, we almost immediately began to access um, barriers for these tenants um, in, in getting the FEMA assistance that they needed. Um, for a number of reasons, I'll just mention a few of them. Um, so FEMA's, uh, turns out, FEMA's sort of COVID era policy as published on their website is that they will not do interior inspections, which um, may give you pause the way it gave me pause because, um, you know, for a lot of our, our clients, uh, you might not be able to assess the seriousness of the damage to their personal property and also the livability of their unit simply by looking at the outside. Um, while tenants are, you know, are encouraged to upload photographs or fax in photographs, um, you know, we often find that those photographs don't actually make their way um, to a place where FEMA uh, personnel can actually see them um, and, for, and, and so that they can be considered. Um, we've also run into problems um, with uh, FEMA um, requiring tenants to, to get verification from their landlords about the extent of the damage. And again, that's a huge problem in a rental housing market where tenants are stuck in properties where they have little to no contact with their landlords. Um, they have are dealing with years of um, deferred maintenance of the properties and we don't have um, you know, a corporate office where we can call and get the letter that they need to send um, to send to FEMA. I'll talk a little bit about an example of that in a minute. Um, and then perhaps the um, seri most serious problem that we've been encountering is a just what it seems to be a total lack of communication between HUD and FEMA. Um, uh, we found out um, that FEMA's um, data matching agreement with HUD um, expired in 2019. Um, and so um, immediately after the storm, um, we perceived to be a just lack of communication between the two agencies when it came to impacted tenants at uh, HUD subsidized properties. And it turns out that that is in fact true. There was a complete lack of communication because the data matching agreement was expired. So um, what that means in practice is that we have a building full of uh, HUD subsidized tenants um, who have um, severe damage, uh, holes in their ceilings, living in their cars, and they're getting FEMA denials despite the fact that um, you know HUD has um, shared the, you know what they're able to share, which is um, you know a property address with FEMA as a as an IDA impacted property. So um, you know we it, what. FEMA seems to be doing um, and what they've shared with us is that they're kind of just doing things on a property by property basis in the absence of a data sharing agreement. Um, we had um, we had one uh, sort of victory, um, I guess you could say, I, although I don't feel like we can really take credit for it, um, is we had uh, one um, project based Section 8 property in uh, Metairie, which is a suburb of New Orleans, uh, 24 out of probably, I don't know, 50 or 60 units were um, severely damaged to the extent where tenants could not live there anymore. Um, we were actually contacted by the property and by the property's um, HUD representative because what they were finding is that these tenants um, were submitting their displacement notices from the property, which were HUD approved language, and yet they were getting denials and um, it sort of and, and or experiencing delays that weren't really explicable. So finally, we basically ran it up at the chain a bunch of times, got um, got uh, people higher up at both HUD and FEMA involved. And um, eventually what happened for these tenants is that FEMA agreed to set up an on-site um, event where tenant, or like not on-site, I think it was at a bingo hall down the street, but close enough that people could walk so that tenants could go and actually just make sure that their FEMA application was um, being processed correctly. And um, the silver lining for these tenants was that it turned out that our housing authority in New Orleans had 100 spare vouchers, Section 8 vouchers for disaster survivors. And so my understanding is that 24 of those were um, earmarked for these tenants. The problem is, of course, this is not a solution because these are 24 tenants out of hundreds, if not thousands, of HUD subsidized tenants that are um, you know, now on the street without the FEMA assistance that they need. 
Um, but it does go to show, I think, that when, you know, enough uh, people with enough resources put their minds together, um, you know, there are solutions to be found. Um, I'm sure I'm way out of time on this. I just wanted to mention um, one other example of um, something we're working on. So we have um, six sort of huge uh, multifamily properties that are all owned by um, a uh, well-known uh, landlord in New Orleans um, who has a bunch of LLCs. They're owned by his LLCs. And he's sort of uh, known for his, um, uh, I would say, exploitative uh, rental housing practices and um, lack of uh, maintenance at his properties. Um, and uh, all these, all six of these properties were in foreclosure prior to Ida. And um, all of them um, due to, you know, in part to, you know, years of deferred maintenance prior to Ida. Um, they uh, sustained a lot of storm damage and a lot of tenants were displaced. We're running into a problem right now with these properties where FEMA is requiring people, for some reason I can't understand, but I'm trying to get an answer to, to submit um, some kind of verification from the landlord that they um, can't live in their units anymore. Well, again, the landlord's totally absent. They're in foreclosure. Um, there's no one on site. Uh, nobody answers the phone. You know, it, it's just like there's this disconnect, it seems, between um, the people who make the rules and the actual reality of what it's like to be a low-income tenant renting a, from a slum landlord um, on the ground. So that's something that we're dealing with right now, um, is sort of working on resolving um, and, uh, you know, perhaps I'll have more updates on that soon. Um, the, la the last thing I'll mention, and, and then again, again, I'll stop because I know I'm way out of time, is, um, you know, at the end of the day, one of the biggest problems we're encountering is that we just have, like, very few vacancies in the housing market. So all these people who are having to move, even if they get FEMA rental assistance, there's nowhere for them to rent. So this is a problem um, for, uh, I just spoke with a landlord who, um, a regional manager who, bless his heart, has been calling like every project-based Section 8 property in the region, seeing if anyone has open units uh, and are willing to do the, uh, a Section 8 pass-through contract for tenants who are going to be displaced. And he's like, nobody has vacancies. Um, and, uh, you know, the other problem is that FEMA on their rental assistance will go up to 175% of um, FMR, but nobody knows that <laughs> and uh, they don't publicize that. So people are getting FEMA rental assistance awards at 100% and you can't simply, there's nothing to rent at 100% of FMR anywhere in the region. Uh, maybe there is at 175, but not at 100%. So anyway, I, I, those are some of the issues that we've been dealing with on the ground. And um, I uh, am happy to talk with anyone uh, who wants to hear more about what we're working on and also anyone who has um, any insight on uh, how, you know, how we might uh, approach some of these problems. Um, and thanks for allowing me to share today. Yes, I'll point out that Hannah's email address is on the slide on the screen right now, hadams at slls.org. Um, and Hannah, I just have one question for you. Um, you've uh, illuminated a lot of these uh, issues, obstacles, barriers to FEMA. Um, what's your current sense of optimism or pessimism that you're going to get much action from FEMA in addressing those issues? Um, that's that's a great question. You know, I would say that we have, um, you know, at this point, um, identified some very uh, kind and helpful people at FEMA who um, have been very helpful in sort of, sort of escalating our concerns. And um, I think there's, I've been hearing a lot of interest in sort of um, talk, all coming together to talk about how we can uh, create a more functional response to the next disaster. Um, and we have also had some success in um, sort of escalating um, uh, cases on a case by case basis up the chain, but um, you know, in terms of in terms of like sort of larger systemic relief, I, I I just don't I can't tell yet. And our concern is that every day that passes, that's um, you know and you know another you know thousands of people who are still sitting and waiting for their assistance um, because of some of the delays that could have been prevented. So I guess the short answer to your question is, um, we found some very helpful people who have been very responsive. I'm not sure in terms of systemic uh, response, what we're, how quickly that's going to happen. Got it. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, if you could please take a look at the chat box in the Q and A, uh, see if there's any questions for you in there. Um, I would like to move our uh, our presentation today along, though. Um, many of you on the call are very interested in what's happening on emergency rental assistance, and you know that we are working very hard to ensure that emergency rental assistance resources are used effectively and expediently in communities throughout the country. Um, and to give us an update on that, I will turn first over to our research analyst, uh, Emma Foley. Emma, take it away, please. Thanks, Joey. Uh, next slide. 
NLIHC continues to track ERA spending using the most current data available. And as of this morning, we're tracking $12.7 billion spent or obligated of ERA-1 funding. This brings the total of ERA-1 expended or obligated to just over 50% of the ERA-1 allocation. Next slide. Despite half of ERA-1 being allocated, there are huge and growing disparities in spending rates across state ERA programs. When accounting for the amount of funding that has been spent or obligated for financial assistance, as well as a projected 10% uh, of administrative funds, four states have obligated all of their ERA-1 funding, which includes New Jersey, Texas, Connecticut, and New York. DC and California are also close behind, obligating approximately 99% of their funds. Meanwhile, the 10 lowest spending states have obligated less than 10% of their ERA-1 allocations. Next slide. This recent increase in funding distribution is a good thing because it means that these programs were able to quickly get funding to renters in need. But unfortunately, it also means that states are starting to run out of funds, even where excess need remains. The Texas Rent Relief Program, the New York Emergency Rental Assistance Program, and the DC Emergency Rental Assistance Program have all uh, placed their application portals on hold for most applicants. New York is still accepting applications for select counties. All three of these programs have indicated that they have received enough eligible allocations to obligate all of their ERA-1 and ERA-2 funds. It's possible that these programs and others will receive additional funding through the reallocation process, but for now, these places have stopped taking applications for their Treasury Emergency Rental Assistance programs. Next slide. And speaking of reallocation and places that may benefit from additional funds, the reallocation process will ramp up a week from today on November 15th. All grantees that have obligated less than 65% of their ERA-1 funds must submit a program, a program in, a performance improvement plan on the 15th, which includes a comprehensive checklist of best practices and also asks programs to commit to specific improvements. This is also a, the due date for the obligated fund certification form, which is a form where grantees can update the amount that they have obligated to date. Grantees who haven't obligated at least 65% of their ERA-1 funds and who spent less than 30% of their funding will be, termin will be determined to have excess funds. The amount of funds taken back by Treasury will be based on the difference between how much a grantee has actually spent and the 30% benchmark set by Treasury. Grantees can potentially avoid recapture or reduce the amount of funds that are recaptured by submitting a program improvement plan a week from now. This will provide a one-time increase in the grantee's spending rate, therefore lowering the amount of funds that are recaptured. If you are curious about whether your state or locality is at risk of having funds recaptured, uh, I see Elena has already posted a link in the chat to a database of state and local grantees and their potential excess funds. There are two calculations in this database based on whether grantees submit a performance improvement plan or do not. Next slide. And finally, if you have any questions about NLIHC's ERA spending or reallocation tracking, um, or any information on updated data that we should include, do feel free to email us at research at NLIHC.org. And now I will pass it over to Sarah Gallagher for our erase updates. Great, thanks, Emma. Sorry, I had a little trouble getting off the video. Um, and I'm just going to go forward two slides because of time. Um, I'm Sarah Gallagher, the director of the senior director of the Erase Project. And as you know, every week we try to have an Erase program spotlight. And our Erase grantees are working to uh, ensure that ERA programs are visible, they're accessible, they're preventive, and they're reaching the low income renters most in need in time to prevent eviction and housing loss. So today for our program spotlight, I'm really excited to have Housing Alliance Pennsylvania here. We've got Chi Yun Kim and Gail Schwartz who are both at Housing Alliance Pennsylvania. And they're gonna be talking about their work working with ERA administrators in, in Pennsylvania as well as some work they've done developing fact-based proxy guide 
um, and some of the guidance they're doing locally around reallocation. So I think, Gail, I'm gonna hand it over to you first. Um, so take it away. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for having us here. Um, as Sarah said, we are the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania. I'm uh, Gail Schwartz, Associate Director of Policy and Strategic Initiatives. Um, I'm joined by my coworker, Chi Hun Kim. Um, can we go to the next slide? So the Housing Alliance, we really try to promote the common sense solutions that balance Pennsylvania's housing market and increase the supply of safe, decent, affordable homes for low income people. The most common sense solution is like emergency rental assistance funded at scale, which is what we are doing right now. But, you know, as many communities and many states this program um, is radically different than anything that we ever saw before. So there's, you know, a great deal of expertise in administering rental assistance programs, but, you know, emerging expertise in uh, this specific emergency rental assistance program. So our approach was to get everybody in a room talking, uh, a Zoom room talking. And so we immediately started reaching out to our partners. Once we knew who was going to be uh, the administering entities, we reached out to our contacts there and said, hey, let's get a meeting together. Let's, you know, once a month get together, talk about what's happening, talk about what's changing. And, you know, you guys can discuss amongst each other the different pieces that you're uh, trying to figure out and uh, bounce ideas off of each other. Um, we also created a uh, listserv of just this small group of um, e uh, ERAP administrators. And so again, uh, in between meetings and as things are changing and as, you know, Treasury is issuing new guidance and as, you know, the state is issuing new guidance because even our, our direct receiving counties still also got some additional funding from the state. It was just a way for us to have this constant uh, back and forth communication about what's new, what's changing and, you know, making sure that people can get ideas and talk through strategies on, you know, different things, different elements of the program as they work to implement and get their programs uh, stood up. Um, we also were able to bring in guest speakers uh, to also speak directly to the group. Um, we were able to get in the special advisor on housing to the state secretary of the Department of Human Services. She came and spoke to the group about, you know, what are some of the things that are coming down the pike from the state. Uh, we were also able to get a uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Noel Poyo to come in partnership with um, Senator Casey's office to come and speak directly to our ERAP administrators uh, and discuss some of the concerns and challenges they had in, um, in implementing the program. Next slide, please. So we've also been really working to just develop as many resources to uh, help uh, people implement guidance uh, and best practices. So, you know, again, we are constantly making sure that people are um, aware whenever Treasury issues something new. Um, I think with so much going on, it's just very easy for emails to get lost in the fray. So sometimes this picks up some stuff. Um, you know, we've even had folks communicate to us that, you know, it's hard to read everything that comes out every time that it comes out. So, you know, we try to synthesize and uh, prioritize what we think is most valuable to the people attending uh, these meetings. Um, we've developed a guide around prioritization. We are looking at case studies for programs around self-attestation, you know, creating partnerships for uh, landlord-tenant eviction diversion and, you know, with courts. Um, we are convening an advisory group of different stakeholders who are, you know, focusing, um, focusing on leveraging the expertise of people from the legal community and people who also um, are very familiar and a part of the business side of the courts. Um, we are constantly putting out analysis of Treasury's, you know, not only their guidance for the program, but also the reallocation guidance. And then we also uh, developed a guide to using fact-based proxy for income determination. And so with that, I'm going to pass it over to my coworker, Chi Hun, who is going to review that guide with all of you. Thanks, Gail. 
Um, so one of the resources um, is around fact-based proxy. Um, it's basically a way um, the treasurer is encouraged to use public available data about um, more or less neighborhood level median incomes to get a reasonable proxy for an applicant's income, which uh, allows their applications to be approved without having um, sometimes really onerous documentation requirements imposed on them. Um, the treasurer is encouraging um, grantees to adopt methods like this um, to really speed up assistance. And this is part of the program improvement plans um, that Emma mentioned earlier. Um, so in our guide, we really wanted to clearly lay this out, uh, this background. Um, and we know that programs like Pennsylvania's own Bucks County, as well as the programs like Kentucky State Program are uh, making use of fact-based proxy and how they're doing that. Um, so we know, as Gail said, that um, really administrators are really stretched thin. So we wanted to um, provide a very thorough step-by-step -step guide with lots of screenshots about how you can get uh, median income data from the US Census, um, whether at the zip code level or at the census tract level. And we also show you how you can get medium income data for either all households within the area or just for renter households. Um, next slide, please. And so our hope in doing this was kind of to realize the potential of using a uh, fact-based proxy. So um, we have access to um, eviction filings data from the administrative office of PA courts. Um, so to, to try to get um, kind of a to quantify what the potential here was, uh, we looked at for every case filed in 2021, uh, we looked at whether they came from zip codes which would have qualified or under for ERA assistance um, as far as income eligibility. And um, of course, you know, an eviction is kind of the last step before many households become homeless. So um, this is a pretty um, eye-opening way to demonstrate how much potential there is. Um, so the greener, if you look in the map on the slide there, the greener the county is, the higher the percentage of cases that are filed in the county come from zip codes that are eligible for um, income qualification using um, self-based proxy, uh, fact-based proxy. And really most counties have a large majority of uh, eviction cases filed that are coming from these zip codes. Um, and so it demonstrates um, how um, the usefulness of um, using facts-based proxy as a way to speed up applications. Um, of course, these numbers are really specific for Pennsylvania, but I would not be at all surprised if uh, you saw similar patterns in other states as well. Um, so that's a quick overview of what we've been doing here at the Housing Alliance, and Gail and I would be happy to take any questions if there's uh, any time. Uh, yeah, thank you for that excellent presentation. Uh, thanks to you all for the presentations on emergency rental assistance. Um, one of the questions that's come up a couple of times in the chat box is, um, what have you done to eliminate technological barriers for people who might need rental assistance, um, specifically people who might be aging and might not be as adept with computers and so forth? Yeah, so I mean, we've seen a, a diversity of um, strategies in that re respect, but I think some of the most dramatic gains are kind of doing uh, blitzes and doing really sort of targeted place-based interventions where people just go out to a site and say, this is where we're going to be and, you know, bring us your stuff. And we are going to help you uh, complete your application. So again, I think that this has uh, worked well in places like Allegheny County and uh, Lancaster, where you know they definitely have um, done not only events like that. I think also um, having drop-in centers as well. I think we've seen uh, communities do that. So it's always kind of um, a hybrid. We also have seen uh, a couple of counties just say that actually the technology barrier is been too high and went back to a paper application. So it's definitely been a mix in the different programs. There is no like one unified program in, in uh, Pennsylvania, the, the way that the state created their program, you know, we have about 18 direct receiving counties, but the state program basically subgranted 
uh, allocations using the same formula that was in consolidated appropriations and you know just sent it out to each individual county so we have 67 versions of ERAP in Pennsylvania that are all slightly different from each other but I think it's it's you know really getting to to meet people where they're at and, you know, having those opportunities, especially now that, you know, folks are more vaccinated in, in kind of in-person strategies. Thank you so much for that answer and for your insights. Um, this was a really great call uh, once again, and I want to offer a hearty thank you uh, to all of our presenters. So um, I think we're gonna end it there for today. Uh, to everyone who attended, please know that we will be sending out the recording and the slides and various notes and links and follow-up email tomorrow. And until next Monday, I hope you have all have a great week. Bye everyone.